Greetings, good morning, and welcome to Mind the Moment. This, my friends, is our coffee house in the cloud, a place to come together, build community, get centered, and celebrate the present moment. It is August 4th, 2020, which in the great state of Illinois is known as Obama Day, an occasion to honor Barack Obama, the 44th president of the United States. Every political figure will inevitably mean different things to different people, but for our purposes here, I'm reminded of a presentation John Kabat-Zinn gave in 2010, in which he referred to then-President Barack Obama as our first mindful president. Kabat-Zinn said he'd come to this determination by observing within Obama the characteristics of someone who is measured, emotionally balanced, peaceful, not driven by the concerns of the ego, and a deep listener. Besides knowing and appreciating the value of listening, Obama also knows well the value of speaking and speaking up. In 2008, he said, quote, one voice can change a room. And if one voice can change a room, then it can change a city. And if it can change a city, it can change a state. And if it can change a state, it can change a nation. And if it can change a nation, it can change the world. Your voice can change the world, end quote. If this then is true, then it only falls to us to be mindful about what it is we say and how it is we say it, and whether we say it early and how often. I am John Roberts from Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare's Mindfulness Program, and if there's one voice that is destined to change this room in an overwhelmingly positive way, it is the voice of Rebecca Wing, licensed clinical professional counselor, longtime teacher of mindfulness, and founder of the Mindfulness Retreat Center of Maine. Good morning to you, Rebecca. Good morning, John. Good to see you. Now, in just a moment, I will invite Rebecca to lead us in a 10-minute guided meditation. Following that, we'll take some time for Q&A and then wrap things up just around 9 a.m. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please take a moment to open up the chat box, which can be accessed using the bar at the bottom of your screen. That chat box is your portal through which to communicate any questions or comments you might have to us. We'd love to know what's on your mind this morning. That being said, uh, Rebecca, is there anything you'd like to ask the folks at home to comment on as we're getting started? Yes, so <clears throat> let's see. Uh, the, the question today to think about is, what intention are you setting for yourself today? In other words, how do you want to be today with yourself and with others? All right, very good. All right, well, so while folks are typing, uh, I'm grateful to everyone for tuning in, taking the time to be with us and each other this morning. Please keep in mind that only Rebecca and I will be able to see anything that you type. And if we don't read your particular question or comment on air, do know that we read and appreciate them all. Before we close, I will point out some other ways for you to stay in touch with us as well. All right, so here are a few that are coming in. Today, I want to be positive and productive. Someone says focused and appreciative. I'm liking these sort of lists. Uh, kind, present, and relaxed. Showing up as a strong leader and professional. Oh, that's very nice. Uh, being more in the moment, not in the past or the future. Attentive, open, and responsive. I would like to be happy and peaceful. Although this person says they're not feeling that way right now. Well, hopefully we, we can help turn that around a little bit. Um, someone says my intention is to be present, to be open, focused and protective, uh, uh, productive rather, although protective would, all, would also work, uh, patient with myself and others. Today I want to accept uh, uh, my healing, uh, not to fight against the slow progress of it. Peaceful, wow, okay, well, I, I, should, I should stop there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just, uh, that's a great, great list. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, Rebecca, when you and I uh, were communicating earlier this week, you mentioned you've been teaching the participants in your weekly meditation group about something that is sometimes referred to as the four qualities of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. now, now, this is actually a top topic that you and I touched on the last time we were together here in the coffee house, but it's a subject that never gets old. I'm wondering if you might describe the four qualities of mindfulness and then guide us in how you've been using those qualities as a jumping off point with your own students. You know, that's why I asked the question today, you know, what's your intention or your highest aspiration for the day? And a lot of times we need help to sort of get a clarity about what, what qualities they are that we're wanting to embody. And the mindfulness tradition that's been pulled from Buddhism speaks about these four qualities that we're all sort of trying to 
become more familiar with and more embody. And so the, the first one is loving kindness. And one of the things about the tradition of mindfulness is they talk about how loving kindness is an innate quality that's intrinsic in our own being. We have that quality already and that it is an ability to tap into that, that gentleness, that quality of being attentive with kindness. So that's the first quality. The second one is compassion. So compassion is a little bit more complicated. Compassion is, is in a sense, acknowledging that being a human being involves pain and suffering. And that what we're learning how to do is understand that that pain and suffering is not only our own, but also other people's. Then the, the last part of the compassionate presence is, can I be with that universal understanding of pain and suffering as part of the human condition with patience, equanimity, and empathy? So it's a quality of accepting, acknowledging pain and suffering as part of the human experience, but then how am I with it, with that quality of patience and kindness? The third quality is uh, sometimes called joyfulness. So joyfulness, oftentimes, if you think of it as being open-hearted, tender-hearted, uh, quality of gratitude and appreciation, playfulness comes in. Also what they call um, sympathetic joy, which is being happy for other people's <clears throat> well-being and other people's good fortune, sympathetic joy. So that quality. And then the fourth one is equanimity. So equanimity has to do with the two qualities that we sometimes struggle with, or I think all humans struggle with, which is attachment to things or aversion to things. I, I want more of this. I don't want that. In equanimity, we, we decide that, you know what? I recognize that I have these states of aversion and, and attraction to things, but I'm going to do the best I can to make room for everything and allow myself to experience all things um, absent those two qualities, making room for everything. So those are the four qualities, kindness or loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And within those four qualities lie almost every single thing that everybody uh, uh, <laughs> put in the chat this, this morning. So that it, what we do in this quality is, is we can do a meditation around what we call a co contemplative meditation. And contemplative meditation is a little bit different than something that is uh, very narrowed down and simple, like, like anchoring the attention on the breath, for instance. This is more about using the imagination. So the imagination is a way of, if you could think of it as rehearsing uh, a quality, a positive quality, so that we get more familiar with not only what we think about the quality, but also in, in this uh, contemplative meditation, I'm gonna guide you through what it feels like in the body. In other words, the kinesthetic experience uh, is a felt sense. It's not a thought sense in, this, in that way. So thinking in words, seeing and in, in, uh, feeling it in our body, and then also being able to imagine seeing it is another quality. So visualizing what it would look like, what I would look like, what other people would look like if I, they were embodying this certain quality. So that's the kind of meditation I'm going to uh, lead you through today. John, does this seem like a good time to meditate or what do you think? I think it's always a good time to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so, so here's what I'm going to tell you to, that, that, to expect from this. I'm going to basically be, be offering some open-ended questions that um, allow you to sit with and uh, explore what it might be, the answer might be. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is when I pose a question and then give you silence, you can either imagine, well, frequently everybody has a different sense that's more strong than the other. Some people only hear words in their head in response. Some people see imagery, imagining the situation, and other people feel it in their body, a kinesthetic experience. Oftentimes you'll have one or more of those three, and that allows us to rehearse the felt sense of our highest intention. So I'm going to go with, I've been kind of batting around the different qualities. Um, why don't we go with patience this morning? It's always an, a good quality to embody. <clears throat> so we're going to be doing a contemplative meditation around the quality of patience. So find your, your seat. Allow yourself to sort of settle in. You want to do the best you can to have your spine upright. 
you might even have to scooch to the edge of your chair a little bit so that your back is actually lifted away from the, the back of the chair. Both feet flat on the floor would be good. And allow your head to align over your shoulders so that the head isn't craning forward this morning. You're just aligned from the base of the spine to the top of the head. And just take a moment to settle into your posture. Maybe take a breath, just arriving. In this moment, as I sit here, if it was possible to embody patience in my shoulders, what would patients feel like in my shoulders? In my breathing this morning, how would I be able to experience patience with my breath in this moment? And what would it feel like if I could right now? If I imagined myself with others, what would my eyes look like in the presence of patience? How would my gaze feel when I was looking at the world with eyes of patience? When moving through my day, one task to another, if my hands could embody patience, how would they move in the presence of that quality? As I walk upon this earth, my stride, its rhythm, its flow, would embody a certain feeling and look a certain way if I could walk with patience. What would it feel like to walk this earth with patience in my stride? In this moment, as I sit here, 
if I could imagine embodying my whole being in presence of patience, how would it feel to sit here in this moment, feeling my body sitting, breathing with patience right now? When the mind drifts away, I can bring patience to the thoughts, deciding to let them go and returning back to embodying the felt sense of patience with my breath in this moment. each breath an opportunity to bring patience to mind. Reconnect to that rise and fall of the breathing now. Take one last moment to imagine what it would be like to live one's life with patience. How you would see yourself move through your day. How would the sound of your voice sound like? How would you respond to people in patience? Just let the imagination explore for a few more moments embodying patience.
And so as we draw the practice to a close, allow yourself to draw that deeper breath back in, moving the hands and feet, maybe a little stretch this morning as we end the practice. <clears throat> wow, that, that was I was really interesting, Rebecca. Let me. Uh, so I presume that there's a whole there's a wide spectrum of uh, 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 ideas or emotions that one could bring into this. Uh, mm -hmm. Expectations, of course. Are there any that you might recommend for people who would like yeah. to try this again on their own? Or? Any of, the, any of the qualities that you have all uh, typed in today, anything from uh, uh, kindness to uh, um, uh, compassion to equanimity to um, even more specific, like <clears throat> I want today to practice kind speech. So you can even re reflect on well, what would my words sound like? What would I say? What would it feel like to speak with those words? So. It's, you know, contemplative meditation has a lot to do with just deciding, okay, what is the quality I'm, I'm contemplating? Obviously, in mindfulness, we would be looking for positive quality. And then working with the imaginative forces to see. So you get to choose. Um, what I usually say to my students is that stick with one for some time. And at the end of your formal meditation, if you're a regular meditator, take the last five minutes to do a little contemplative meditation around that quality so that you're reinforcing it each time. Because of course the neuroscience says that what you put your focus on rewires the brain to develop that quality. So when we develop this, this um, curiosity about a certain quality that you want to embody, perhaps it's in direct response to something that you're not. <laughs> so in other words, if you're a very impatient person, well then patience would be a nice one to, to explore. But you get the point that, that if I want to be calm and I'm anxious, then maybe that's the quality I want to embody and I want to practice in contemplative meditation. So think of it as a rehearsal in your morning meditation that each day, a few moments of reflecting on, on this day may I be, dot, 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 and then really think about what those qualities feel like. Yeah, so this might be a, sound like a silly question, but you said, uh, you know, of, of course, you'd want to focus on a positive quality, but could there be any, any useful way to focus on what we might consider to be a negative quality, perhaps as a way to, uh, for lack of a better term, deprogram our association with that quality? That's a good question. I think one of the biggest challenges with the human brain is that we tend to have a negativity bias. So we, we're very very familiar with what it means to reflect on the negative qualities that we have. And so it becomes kind of a habitual state where we think if we're constantly thinking about what we're doing wrong, that we're going to snap ourselves out of it. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not how it works. Um, you know, that, that uh, blame and shame is really not an effective success strategy. So then that's why, in, in my view, that the, the rehearsal of a positive quality has more, more traction because it gives you another way of tra training the attention towards that which you're wanting to embody versus the, the times when you miss the mark. Mm -hmm. So I, I, people watching, I want to make sure that you, uh, we, we'd love to hear uh, what you thought of your experience of doing this meditation, any questions you might have about it or any other questions that you might have for Rebecca. Uh, okay, well, here, well, great, ask and you shall receive. Uh, somebody said, uh, says, I found it impossible to contemplate any of this without incorporating compassion. Yeah. If I were to walk in patience, it would result in frustration if I didn't have compassion for the speed the world was going at in relationship to how I want it to go. It's a really interesting way to put yeah. that. She, uh, the person asks, is that common? Yes, so when, when I recited the four, four qualities of mindfulness, you would have heard different words uh, of different qualities within each of the qualities. So kindness involves a certain gentleness and patience. So does compassion. So does joy. And so when you really begin to, to reflect on these qualities, you can understand how they really are, uh, 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 what's the right word, enmeshed in, in, in themselves. Sometimes we have to pull them apart a little bit to, to explore them, but I think that's a beautiful and, and very good point. Being, being patient does in fact involve being in the presence of people suffering with compassion and uh, patience, yeah. 
and, and somebody uh, uh, wrote in a recommendation, uh, the person says uh, they just finished uh, the, I, I believe uh, the book, uh, Compassion and Self-Hate in Alternative to Despair um, by mm. Dr. Rubin. I don't know, I don't know Dr. Rubin, but um, uh, might be worth checking out. All right. Um, so, uh, so I, <laughs> Rebecca, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off script here because uh, I guess this conversation is, is causing several things to alight in my head. So. You mentioned that the brain has this negativity bias, uh, which we've sort of talked about here in the coffee house before, but also at the beginning, when you were talking about the four qualities of mindfulness, you also mentioned that we have an innate, uh, 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 the innate ability to uh, uh, experience loving kindness. And these things, I wonder, are, are they at odds with one another? I, um, is it, or, or are these just the two things that are kind of like, um, you know, battling within us for and dominance. Say, so the difference between aggression and 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 uh, hatefulness or spitefulness versus loving kindness is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or or how is it that we have the innate the both of these things are yeah. are innate? You know. Yeah. Well, and that's that quality of recognizing that we have these two parts of the brain. Uh, one is survival based, and the other one is more uh, evolved in in its thinking capacity. So, and when we're in survival-based mode, which many Americans are in right now, uh, oftentimes aggression arises because we feel we need to survive. And the, in order to do that, we need to be aggressive or run away or freeze, right? But when we move into those times, sometimes we really need those qualities because we need to survive. So we're in danger, then we need to, to in a, a certain way, develop a certain form of intensity of emotion. So when we're in co contemplative practice and when we're looking for mindfulness, we're also gathering more strength with the other part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which really houses this ability to reassure ourselves that we're safe. That at any given moment, uh, if I'm sitting in my home, simply answering emails, I can and recognize and feel what it feels like to feel safe peace and that calm. So I'm reassuring that part of myself, not only my higher thinking brain, but my, my more reactive primitive brain that's, that's locked oftentimes in, in anxiety or fear or overwhelm, uh, stress. And so that realization that because we have these two aspects of, our, of the mind in our brain, the organ of the brain, then it's our best interest to have a relationship with both of them, a working relationship. All of us have a very strong relationship with the emotional centers of the brain because those are right online from day one of birth. Because I need to cry and let you know I'm not okay in order for you to feed me, otherwise I die. I have to have that lined up in my brain right from the get-go. The qualities of compassion and presence of empathy, those qualities do not evolve right away. They are things that we gradually learn and, and, and learn how to embody through, frankly, study and watching other people who embody that uh, or uh, uh, learning certain uh, uh, teachings that, that give that to us. And so it's a very different form of evolution. If a person has never been taught uh, loving kindness, then it's very difficult for them in their life to embody that. If a person has the opportunity to learn loving kindness, it triggers that felt sense of, oh, okay, right. And so why is that important? Because loving kindness feels good and aggression and hatred and uh, fear doesn't feel very good. So we can recognize the value of developing these qualities. Oh, it's very powerful. Uh, well, Re Rebecca, I, uh, <laughs> I should, to be cognizant of folks' time, I should uh, sort of start to wrap this up as, as much as I, uh, I hate to do so, but uh, so folks uh, watching at home, we're back with you every Tuesday and Friday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. You can find the links to these sessions and other resources at our main site at harvardpilgrim.org slash mindfulness. If you have questions for our experts that we didn't get to here or that you think of later on in the week, please send them to askmtm at harvardpilgrim.org and we will get them answered. Or feel free to leave me a voicemail at 617-509-7047. Now you can see what we have been up to uh, lately on our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com slash mindthemoment. And you can also uh, rewatch uh, this session, older sessions, and introductory sessions on our YouTube 
page. That's youtube.com slash mind the moment. So Rebecca, let me, um, let me skip ahead right to just asking if you could uh, share uh, at least one resource uh, yes. for the folks at home to help continue their practice as we uh, so, as they go forward. Uh, so a book that goes pretty deep into this, this uh, whole aspect of the four attitudes or four qualities of mindfulness is a book called Mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And the subtitle is Ancient Wisdom Meets Modern Psychology. Ancient Wisdom Meets Modern Psychology by uh, Feldman and the last name of the other person is Kuken, which is K-U-Y-K-E-N, Feld Feldman and Kuken, Mindfulness, Ancient Wisdom Meets Modern Psychology. All right, excellent. All right, Rebecca, yes. it was so nice talking to you as always. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to everyone who joined us uh, at home. Uh, great to see and communicate with you all. And uh, we hope to do it again very soon. All right, thank Thanks, you Thanks everybody. Have bye a bye. Have a nice day, folks. <laughs>